So my name is Ed Bass, and this is the um, Amador County Master Gardeners uh, class on what's bugging you. The class will be presented today by two of our Master Gardeners, uh, Maureen Angle and Doris Mosblech, and we'll get started in a minute or two. Um, meantime, a few things. Let's see. Uh, the meeting, I don't know if you've attended our in-person classes. This is the way we prefer to do it. But right now, uh, we're all staying at home and doing it on Zoom. So it's a little bit different experience. And, and I apologize that we don't have the intimacy that we had as uh, in-person. And hopefully, we'll be back to that one of these days. So if you're not used to Zoom, uh, let me just point out that at the bottom of your Zoom window, you'll see uh, um, a little button that says chat, uh, you might have to push the button that says more and then find the button that says chat. Uh, so if you have a question, what we'd like you to do is write it in the chat window. Uh, we're, we're muting everybody because if it gets to be kind of chaotic if um, everybody's talking at once and especially if you, you, you forget that you're not muted and you're talking. So we've muted everybody except those that are uh, presenting. And so look for that chat uh, box where you can enter a question. Uh, so let's see, what else? Oh, there's a poll. Um, Tracy, have you started the poll yet? Yeah, there is a poll. So we're, we're just trying to do some demographics about if you're from Mamador County or not, and if you've attended our classes in person or um, only on Zoom just helps us to understand how we're uh, organizing the class. And let's see what else we have. Did I tell you the um, class is about an hour long? Uh, we'll have some time for questions at the end. So uh, again, I encourage you to put your questions in the chat and we'll address those questions as we can. So it looks like we have quite a few of you that have come to our in-person classes. That's good. Yeah. And we've got people from El Dorado County and Amador County. That's nice. And we have all levels of experience. Great. We'll let that poll run for a few more minutes, get everybody a chance to uh, answer the poll. So, um, Tracy or Ed, is there anything I forgot to mention? I can't think of anything. Yeah. I think you covered it, Ed. Great job. Okay, so we'll probably, we, we've got a website. I don't know if everybody knows what our website is. I'll, I'll dig up that URL and put it in the chat. The uh, presentation will be available in, uh, in, on our website uh, to download later. Oh, well, we've got somebody from Stanislaus County. Uh, hi, Rachel. Thanks for coming. I know it's a long drive, huh? Yeah, somebody's asking about the border bugs. We'll, we'll get to that, I think. Well, uh, Doris, do you want to start your presentation? Sure, just a sec. Okay. Okay. So you should be seeing my my little what's bugging you green screen. And I'd like to welcome you to the Amador County Master Gardeners presentation about integrated pest management. Uh, Maureen Angle and myself will be presenting and we have a lot of, of subject matter to cover today. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Okay, what is IPM? IPM is an ecosystem-based strategy that focuses on long-term prevention of pests or their damage through a combination of techniques such as biological control, 
habitat manipulation, modification of cultural practices, and use of resistant varieties. Pesticides are used only after monitoring indicates that they're needed according to established guidelines, and treatments are made with the goal of removing only the target organism. <clears throat> Pest control materials are selected and applied in a manner that minimizes risk to human health, beneficial and non-target organisms, and the environment. How does IPM work? IPM focuses on long-term prevention of pests or their damage by managing the ecosystem. In IPM, monitoring and correct pest identification help you decide whether management is actually needed. IPM programs combine management approaches for greater effectiveness, and it's based on scientific research. So the first, what subjects we're going to cover are mechanical, physical, and cultural control, uh, weeds, disease, and pests, biological controls. We're gonna talk about what beneficials we have in, in the Amador area and how you can attract them. And we're gonna talk about chemical control, what to use, how to use it. So like I said, we've got a lot of space to cover today. Mechanical and physical controls kill a pest directly. <clears throat> they block the pest out or they make the environment unsuitable for it. Traps for rodents are examples of mechanical control. Physical controls include mulches for weed management, steam sterilization of the soil for disease management, or barriers such as screens to keep birds and insects out. So good old weeds. Weeds, those things that are growing in your garden that you really don't want, want there. My dad always used to say, weeds are merely a plant out of place. So like one of our master gardeners um, did, he had a plantain that he decided wasn't a weed and now it's a decorative piece of, of part of his garden. Mulching is a great way to prevent many weeds from growing to begin with. <clears throat> Pine needles and leaf litter make great mulch and using them as mulch eliminates the need to burn them so much and that helps with our air quality. Also, grass clippings or straw make good mulch product. All of these will ultimately decompose and add nutrients back into your soil. If you desire a more finished look to your garden, wood chips or bark can be used. The key to eliminating weeds once they've started growing is to do it early and often. If you allow the weeds to gain a foothold and to bear seed, you'll have more issues with them the following season. Hand pulling is an excellent way to specifically target the plants you wish to eliminate, and then a hoe can be used on larger infestations or mature plants. Several types of hoes are available. Just make sure that the one that you use is able to cut the weed off at the soil surface. Disease. Many diseases can affect your garden, and it's not always easy to determine what the disease might be or how to resolve it. The best medicine, of course, is prevention. It always is, isn't it? Reduce the stress the plant may be under. Make certain that it's receiving adequate water, but not too much. Keep the leaves dry if possible. Reduce competition for nutrients by eliminating weeds and make certain that it's getting the appropriate amount of sunlight. Most importantly, plant varieties that, plant varieties that are resistant to diseases that are common in your area. If you're getting free plants from somebody, be careful of them. Inspect them for pests before you plant them in your garden and try not to import diseases to our area that, shouldn't, that aren't normally here. If you're buying, plan to buy local because those are, they're gonna have the same diseases that everybody else does. If your garden does develop a disease, the first step should be to identify the problem. You can do this to, by going to the UCANR IPM website. Um, <clears throat> Tracy or Ed, would you put the, um, the URL in the chat so that they've got that? Once you've identified the, the disease, you can follow the solution recommendations on the site to resolve your problem. Alternatively, you can contact the master gardeners at area code 209-223-6838 on our, or on our website. And once again, I'm not gonna try to read the URL because it's really long, um, but somebody will put it into the chat window for you and it'll be available um, on the website um, afterwards. Once you get to the website, click on Ask a Master Gardener. Additionally, 
you should be careful about composting. If you have disease in your garden, don't include the diseased leaves in your compost as it'll just perpetuate the disease throughout your garden. Okay, the other thing that you can do is, oh, I'm sorry, um, pests are an issue. Um, they invade our garden, they eat our plants that we've worked so hard to grow healthy and productive and dealing with them is truly a challenge. The different types of pests that we need to deal with are vertebrate, those with actual internal skeletons, birds, mammals, um, and reptiles, or the invertebrate guys, the insects, uh, the mites, the mollusks, good old snails, and nematodes. We can't go into everything that can be mechanically done to control these pests, but we can co cover some of the major areas. So the first thing is, is we can prevent a lot of things. <clears throat> One of the most effective methods of controlling pests in your garden is to prevent them from coming in at all. Um, some products that could help with that are barriers to prevent the pest from entering your garden to begin with. Some examples of those are fencing to keep deer, turkeys, and other large pests out of your garden. Gopher baskets to protect plants from digging rodents such as gophers, ground squirrels, and moles. And here are some examples of gopher baskets that are available um, online pretty much to order. Petroleum jelly, believe it or not. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Hardware cloth can be put in the bottoms of your raised beds and that will keep your digging rodents out of it. Petroleum jelly can be used to stop crawling insects on smaller trees. Um, you know, good old Vaseline. Um, or it can be used on hanging chains like for your hummingbird feeders to stop ants or on the tops of your, on the rim of your pots. For larger trees, you can use Tanglefoot <clears throat> and it protects the tree against crawling insects that are crawling up the trunk of the tree. <sighs> The next thing you can do is, is make the environment inhospitable for, for the pests, you know, scare them away. You can put bird netting on. And we actually, many of our master gardeners use um, tulle, which is a fabric. It's the, the little net fabric that, that you use in, in ballerina costumes. Um, and it's easier on the birds and it's washable. So you can use it over and over and over again. We would recommend that you use green stuff if you do it because it's a whole lot prettier in your garden. You can make your environment very in inhospitable for birds especially by using reflective tape. Um, here you have some examples of how they might use reflective tape in um, vineyards or in orchards. Or you can use scarecrows and scarecrows come in all sorts of types from the Wizard of Oz kind to um, images of predator birds. Or if you want to get really elegant, you could use motion activated sprinklers. Not sure how, how effective these would be in a larger area, but if you've got a small garden, it would probably help with rabbits and cats and stuff like that. Okay. You can also plant what they don't like. If your plants are poisonous or inedible for the pest, or they have thorns or an unpleasant texture to the leaves, the pests are more likely to leave them alone, and then it doesn't matter if they're around. A great resource for finding deer-resistant native plants is the California Natives website, and I have that URL available, and it can be put into the chat for everybody. Other resources include your, mas your local nursery garden or the master gardeners. Okay, biological controls. Oh, I'm sorry. I have this screen that's giving, giving me an extra, an extra slide and it's confusing me, so I do apologize. Once the, the pests are in your garden, you'll need to find some way of eliminating them. You can pick them off the plant and dispose of them if they're large enough to handle and slow enough to catch. The operative term for me, of course, is slow enough to catch. You can knock them off your plants with a strong spray of water. This time, when getting, 
is not a bad thing to get the leaves wet, or you can trap them and dispose of them. This is somewhat complicated since it may involve killing the pest and local ordinance will dictate pr the proper disposal. If you trap and kill and you have to dispose, dispose of it, you have to do that on your own property. Your smaller, smaller animal bodies can be put in your trash. Larger ones may need to be disposed of at the dump for a fee. Next on the list is biological controls. I mean, th there are actually insects and animals that you can let be in your garden who will help prey on the insects and animals that are hurting your garden. So here are a list of some of the beneficials that we know about. The first one, of course, is our famous convergent lady beetle. Um, she likes to eat aphids and sometimes white flies and other soft bodies insects. And what, what there is here is, is a picture of not only the adult, but the, the larvae, because you'll notice that the larva looks a whole lot different from the adult. They both eat aphids, so this is a good thing. Next on the list is green lacewings. The larva feed on mites and aphids. Damsel, uh, the surfid flower or hover bees eat mostly aphids. And you'll notice once again, here's the adult and here's the larva. And they look, you wouldn't know that they were related. Next on the list is damsel bugs. Now for the longest time, I wondered what those, those um, Jurassic Park insects in my garden were. And now I know damsel bugs and they, they eat the bad bugs, so I'm gonna keep them around. Predaceous ground beetles stalk soil dwelling insects such as cutworms and root maggots. Assassin bugs will attack almost any insect. Predatory wasps prey on aphids, caterpillars, and other insects by literally laying their eggs in the body of the prey and letting the, the babies come out and eat them from the inside out. <laughs> okay. Most spiders are good. Um, they're beneficials because they attack all, all types of insects. So keep those cobwebs. And praying mantids. Now, Praying mantids are a little special because they'll eat everything and anything. So we don't usually call them beneficials because they'll also eat other beneficials, but they do eat everything and that's a good thing. Additionally, you've got your bigger beneficials, lizards, frogs, toads, and snakes. Although some lizards eat plants, most lizards feed on insects in California. The most common type feed on beetles, ants, wasps, aphids, grasshoppers, and spiders. So you'll, you'll notice that a lot of your, your pest type insects are included in that list. Invertebrates such as insects are the most common food items for adult frogs. The larger frogs frequent, frequently eat vertebrates such as Pacific tree frogs and California mice. So that's always nice, believe it or not. Frogs eat mice, that's amazing. Um, toads feed on a wide variety of insects and invertebrates. Its diet includes grasshoppers, beetles, flies, and mosquitoes. And then, of course, down here you have a snake. The California king snake um, eats frogs, lizards, little turtles, and mice. And they frequently even chow down on fellow snakes, especially rattlesnakes. So if you find a king snake, you should be, you know, make him a happy home because he'll help with rattlesnakes. So how do you attract your beneficials? The best way to do this is to create a diverse landscape that you have in your garden that's predominantly native and or Mediterranean and by avoiding pesticides. Such a landscape and sustainable practice will provide what your good bugs need, like all wildlife, food, water, shelter, places to start their young, and an environment free of toxins. Some of your beneficial's favorite plants are native buckwheats, coffee berry, California lilac, coyote brush, elderberry, manzanita, salvias, penstemons, and many herbs. Good places to find these recommended plants are at the California Native Plant Society, 
and at UCCE at ucanr.edu. Additionally, the UC Davis Arboretum often sells California native plants at their fundraising events, so you should keep an eye out for those. Okay. So at that, this point, I am going to turn this program over to Maureen, and Maureen is going to talk to you about chemicals and pesticides. Okay, are we ready? Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for attending. Um, this could be a little tricky. I'm in Ione, and Doris is in Pioneer, and she's going to click for me. So if there's a little bit of a delay here and there, uh, please forgive us. Okay, before I begin, so hold there a minute, Doris. Um, one note about the tool netting for um, fruit trees because um, I do use that successfully. One thing you want to remember is the holes are very tiny. Pollinators can't necessarily fly through those holes. So you don't put that netting on until everything's been pollinated and your fruit, if you're using fruit um, or berries, has begun to grow. So you need to wait till everything's pollinated, then cover it with that tool netting. Um, works quite well. I've got grapes protected under it at this very moment. Okay, um, I have the section that they call chemical control. And really all it means is using some sort of substance on your um, garden. So, okay, let's see. Because a chemical is simply a substance. Now pesticides are substances that, they don't always kill everything, but they're meant to control, um, prevent, maybe repel pests. Okay, next. Doris, thanks. Um, and there may be a delay on, I have a very slow internet, so I might not see the change right away. Okay, when we were pre preparing this, we got into a discussion about what are organic materials that you would use in, as a pesticide and what are not. So I thought I'd address that right up front because there's a little bit of confusion depending on your background. If you remember way back to high school chemistry, we were all taught that organic things contained carbon. That was the main idea. If something like sugar, the uh, formula for sugar is C6H12O6, you don't care about that, but there's the C. Carbon dioxide is CO2, there's the C. Those, we were taught that those are considered organic products. Okay, now move yourself up to 2020 and you're in your garden. And the term is not used exactly the same thing, same way. So what I did is I pulled the definition that the master gardeners use from their handbook, which is if we are not sure of an answer, the first place we go to look, see if somebody else already came up with it and it's in our handbook. So the definition of organic, as far as garden products, as far as the master gardeners are concerned, is that they're made from naturally derived products or materials. And so that means it's gonna be a plant or a mineral and petroleum counts as that, oil products count. And that these organic products have no synthetic or man-made substances in them. So, for it to be organic, it has to be derived from nature without any interference from man. Now, that's very possible. Where things fall apart a little bit is between the origin of the substance and what we see on the shelf at the store. Because if processes are used along the way, it can prevent it from being a true organic product. There's really no way for you or I to know whether the materials were handled properly. So somebody else is in charge of that for us. There is an organization called um, Organic Materials Review Institute, otherwise known as OMRI, and they look at products and they follow the process to make sure if they had a natural origin, that when we get the product, at the store, it is still organic or natural. Uh, a quick example would be corn chips. You can have corn chips that are made from totally organic products, 
But if they mess with them along the way in the production, by the time they're in the bag, they're no longer considered organic. So to save you a lot of trouble, what you want to do is look for the OMRI label, O-M-R-I. They've already taken care of that for us. So we can feel pretty sure that if something is labeled with OMRI, it's safe to use in our organic gardens. Now, the government has helped also. The USDA has a national organic program. They regulate um, more of the commercial people. So that would be more, again, if you bought a product someplace and you were wondering if it was organic, it might have the USDA organic label on it. But if it's not labeled with something like that, you don't really know for sure uh, because the, the term organic is still a little bit loose as far as uh, gardening goes. Okay, Doris, next please. All right, now, if you do choose to use a substance or a pesticide from the store, it's important for you to know what, what you're after, what you need, and what you don't need. Now, pesticides kind of come in two broad categories, and these apply for insects, generally, or for plants, for weed. Some things are called broad spectrum, and you can see that's basically a pesticide that'll kill just about anything. Then th they also have products that are more selective, and those are targeted to certain organisms. Now, you've kind of experienced this idea if you've ever taken antibiotics. You go to the doctor. They're not exactly sure what your infection is. If it's not too bad, they're going to give you a broad spectrum antibiotic. It'll kill off almost all the germs in your body. It's how you feel. If they're very, if they're sure of what you've got, now they might target that with a specific antibiotic. They might be more selective, but we do the same thing in the garden. Okay, a broad, they're, they're both effective. However, a broad spectrum pesticide can have unintended consequences. It goes back to what Doris was just talking about with the beneficials, because the broad, let's talk insects. The broad spectrum, will kill anything that's alive there in the spraying area, whether it's a good bug or a bad bug. And a lot of times we get calls that people's yards, uh, some of their planting areas have gone crazy with insects. It's because they sprayed a broad spectrum a couple weeks ago. They killed all the good guys. Now the bad bugs have basically taken over. So you really want to be careful about broad spectrum. There's probably not too many reasons to use it. Um, I've listed some of the good guys, um, everything from good caterpillars to bees can get. And if you have a fish pond, you know, where I used to live, everybody used ant spray. Everybody carried a can of ant spray in their back pocket. And a lot of people suffered with their little fish ponds or koi ponds were poisoned or your fish bowl. My dad killed our fish spray and ant spray in the house, fly spray in the house when we were kids. So think carefully and read your label. I'm gonna keep coming back to read your label. Um, oh, another problem with the selective pesticide is it targets um, a limited number of organisms. If you keep using it, some of the organisms get used to it. They, they build up an immunity. Now, the insects don't suddenly become you know, not affected by your uh, product, but some of them always live through the application. And then those stronger ones go on and have babies, and now their babies are no longer affected by that application. So you will produce uh, insects that are immune to the application over time. So you really want to think whether you need to introduce these chemicals into your yard. Next, please. Okay, there's the way we use these pesticide chemicals. Again, pretty much whether we're using them against insects um, or, or something like that, animals, or we're using them against weeds. They basically are applied in two different ways. Either they're called non-systemic, where they're basically sprayed on the plant and it affects the outside of the plant or uh, drips down to the roots or um, a direct systemic insecticide. 
and that's applied directly into the ground and then taken up in the plant. Now, the non-systemic, uh, it has an effect where it kills pretty immediately, quick effect. The systemic takes time. If it's an insect drafter, the material has to go through the plant and then the insect has to eat the plant. And then when it eats the plant, it gets sick and dies. So that takes time for all that to happen. Now, if you're after weeds, um, a non-systemic application, you'll probably th see dead stuff the next day. If you're do using a systemic insecticide properly, you won't see any effect for several days, but that proves you're using it properly. So, uh, you know, you have to kind of know what to expect. You don't want to use systemic and then you don't see any effect and you add more. More is not better in any of these circumstances. Um, one note that I'll come back to, please please look at in my um, little diagrams, the clothing that the people have on when they're applying the materials and I'll come back to that. Next, please. Okay, there's a lot of different pests and I'm gonna talk about each one for just a couple minutes. So the different pests that we get questions on. Now we're, Master Gardeners deal with home gardeners. So all our advice is for a home situation. Maybe you have a 10th of an acre in a regular neighborhood. Maybe you have 10 acres, but we, we just deal with home gardening questions. So those are the kind of uh, pests we're gonna address. We're gonna talk about uh, what we use on weeds, um, insects, uh, mites, but I'm gonna do each one, do a couple minutes on each one. So first step I think is weeds. Next please. I'm gonna take these apart, Doris, thanks. Okay, now first, um, and I know Ed Bass has heard my plea on this. When we talk about weeds, I, weeds are in the eyes of the beholder. And of course you don't want them every place in your yard, but I'm making a plea for you to keep a few weeds around before you start trying to get rid of all of them. The, um, last year when I was weed whacking, I happened to be, take a close look at some of the dandelions growing on the side of my house. They were incubating new ladybugs. All the dandelions appeared to be um, a nursery for ladybugs that year. So I didn't cut those down. I waited until everybody was gone. Um, some weeds are California wildflowers and the beneficials are looking for them. Uh, I, I grew up elsewhere in the state. I was visiting my daughter here several years ago and her front yard was absolutely full of wildflowers. And I commented to her how beautiful the California wildflowers, she had like eight different types in her front yard. Her response to me was, yeah, mom, I had to get the weed whacker out and cut those weeds down as soon as I get a chance. So what I viewed as California wildflowers, my daughter definitely considered weeds. So think about that. Maybe you don't wanna cut all your weeds down, but if you do wanna get rid of them, there are uh, types, the pesticide you would be looking for is an herbicide, okay? Because not all pesticides are meant for every single organism. They're, they're different types because they work differently for different kind of living organisms. So we use herbicides on weeds. That can be tricky. You need to apply it at the right time. Some materials are what we call pre-emergent. To be effective, you need to apply them kind of where you think the weeds are gonna come up because you actually apply them before they start to grow. Star thistle, something like that, that you know where it's coming. You know, but other than that, um, you have to know where the weeds are gonna be to use a pre-emergent. Other types are post-emergent. So that's after they've emerged, after they've come up. And so you, not all of them are effective for all plants. You need to read the label, you need to know what your weed is if possible, because we do have weeds here in um, Amador that are immune to all of the herbicides and that collection is growing. Now the, oh, herbicides are selective because there's often other plants growing around them that you don't wanna kill. So you need to read the labels. An example would be, 
there's products that will kill the leafy weeds in your lawn or your grass, but they don't kill the grass. And then there's other things that will kill the grass. So you need to be very careful if you're using an herbicide at what you're targeting and how you're targeting it. And again, more is not better. Be patient and wait for it to work. Uh, you really want to avoid broad spectrum. If you see on a label, it's a broad spectrum weed killer, you're going to kill everything green in your garden. So you really want to target the specific weed. Okay, I'm going to do, I've got fungi on this uh, slide, but I'm going to target it a different slide. So Doris, please click. Okay. Now insects, we're using an insecticide. You want to make sure the label says that. There are a lot of different types, and I'm going to talk about um, the effect and the use of several different types. Now, the top of my list are typical chemicals, some of which are somewhat bee friendly, but you have to be very careful because a lot of the chemicals have similar names. Now, the ones I put in red with the down arrow, uh, not all of those are even available to us anymore as a a home gardener, but you really want to avoid those substances. Um, there's a lot of problem with bees and other pollinators, and uh, some of the research is tying it back to some of these chemicals. Now, what you can use very effectively, or what I have at the bottom, are oils and insecticidal soaps, and I'll give details on those. Um, and I'll talk about some specific insects when I get there. So in, you're looking for an insecticide. And I have a picture of aphids here. This will come out of my mouth over and over. I'll keep going back to what Dora said. A whole lot of the insects we have that we have products on the market for, you could get rid of them by just spraying them with a hard spray of water first thing in the morning for a few days in a row. So kind of your number one insecticide to try is a hard blast of water. And I know there are controversies about getting our leaves wet and all that, but you know, it was 104 at my house yesterday. Things didn't stay wet too long. And most of us in, even along the foothills, the air is very dry here. The, the garden dries out pretty quick. If you get out there in the morning, give it a hard blast of water, it'll be, you won't have problems. Okay, next please. I'm gonna talk more about the soaps and oils. Okay, a miticide. This is kind of an interesting one. We do have, especially right now with the uh, hot winds, spider mites are attacking a lot of the plants around here. Now, the miticide that we would, the type of miticides that we would recommend are oils and soaps. You don't see too many chemical type products, spray type that uh, you might think would be used against mites because they sound kind of icky. Again, you can spray these guys off with water. The spider mites we have in this area, they kind of attack plants that are sort of drying out already. If maybe you haven't been keeping up on your watering or the heat is just overtaking some of your plants, those are the ones you might notice have little webby parts all over them. There's a lot of spider mites out right now. First of all, you can blast them with the water. You can, you can, can, what you can do with the water is control the numbers a little bit. And then you can go back and apply something like neem oil or an insecticidal soap to kind of do the job well. But you can decrease their numbers with water by spraying directly at the nest. Actually wash all those webs off your plants and then go back and apply lightly, according to the label directions, um, an oil, a plant oil like neem oil or an insecticidal soap. There's no, just because these guys are ugly, there's no reason to go spraying a bunch of chemicals with strange names on them. It won't be effective. And this is one of the little boogers that when people use broad spectrum and they kill off the beneficials or the predator bugs, we actually have predator insects in our garden that are the good guys. Doris was talking about them. Broad spectrum pesticides will kill everybody but not hurt these guys. And then you have your guard over, garden overrun with spider mites or other types of mites. Let's see. Some of these, like you can control some of these guys with water. If you have patience, 
if you can bring the numbers down a little bit, the natural predator bugs will feast on these guys. So you just have to have a little patience. Insects are very resistant. They've been around a lot longer than we have. They know how to get by in troublesome times, but we're smarter. Oh, and the problem with the mites is that they uh, bite your plants and then suck them dry. So they kind of suck all the life out of your plants. Don't want to let them do that. And they will be out until September. Okay, next, please. Now this one's a little nastier. And Doris already talked to you about using traps for rodents. And that's actually what the master gardeners recommend are the various types of traps. But I'm going to talk more about the chemicals right now. Or you get a cat if you can't, because those that works well too. But some of the chemicals that are out, I have them in red, um, they work mostly, they're anticoagulants. So the rodent, let, let's say it's a rat um, or a vole or something, they'll eat the, the pesticide that's in some sort of trap and then they'll off. But most of the time in multiple doses because you can't use uh, a pesticide that's too strong out in nature. So what ends up happening is to actually kill the animal, the traps have to, bait has to be put out multiple times because you have to build, it has to build up in their system. And then what happens is they bleed out for internally. So another issue with that is if you give them the poison and then they wander around and they end up in the walls of your house or your uh, barn, and then you have a dead rodent in there um, and you'll know it eventually and have to deal with that. So uh, there's a couple problems with using bait to try to kill, um, I know to try to kill rodents. I know we have quite a gopher problem here and um, voles I think have actually gotten into one of my raised beds. And the first thing my husband said is, well, you know, what kind of poison do you use? And I said, none. Um, and then I gave him the list why. They, it does require multiple doses. And then you have a hazard to other predators or other animals, much less your pets. Uh, I had to set out rat traps last year and they kept disappearing and I couldn't figure out where they went. I, I grew up in the sea. Nobody told me you have to actually attach them to the ground. And I realized later, uh, we had a couple suspects, but I realized later that if I'd been using poison, whoever was stealing my rats was stealing the poison too. And that isn't at all what I um, wanted. And I, I think it's great horned owls that were taking my rats. Definitely, I don't want to be poisoning them. Now, another pest that uh, chemicals are often of a concern for people is for snails and slugs. So the uh, Doris, let's go to the next slide and I'll talk about that. Hey, if you're old and you've been gardening for a while, you um, had heard that sluggo and different snail baits were poison to our animals, and they have been. A lot of animals have eaten them. You know, some people's dogs will eat anything. And, but now, because of that, they have new snail bait, and it's actually used by organic gardeners. So, the snail bait that we use now is iron phosphate. And it's non, I mean, you can't really eat it, but it's non-toxic to pets or humans. What it does to the snails and slugs is take away their desire to eat. If they eat the snail bait, then they slither off, but they lose their ability, well, their desire to eat. So they basically go off and starve to death. Now that's, you know, dead snails off in the garden isn't a real big problem. What you want to avoid though, if you have products that are old, maybe sitting on the shelf from who knows when, metaldehyde is the chemical that was the poison in the old type of snail bait. So if you have snail bait that's years old, please dispose of it properly. It is a hazardous waste. But if you choose to use a snail bait, they are uh, much safer these days. I'm not sure if it's a UC um, method, but a whole lot of us put the ashes from 
the ashes from a wood fire around. Snails don't like to crawl through particles like that. So, but you just have to not overdo it. So be careful about your snail bait. Now, you can, you know, you get out first thing in the morning or go out with a flashlight in the evening. You can follow Doris's directions and just pick them off. There's no, you know, don't you love picking a snail and maybe throwing it in the street or someplace where it's going to suffer? Um, I know that sounds mean, but a lot of us do. Okay, all right, next. Okay, now fungicides. The, um, a lot of us that have roses notice that especially in the hot, windy times, kind of a white powdery uh, material will build up on the leaves and it affects some of the flowers I have in my backyard appear to have it right now too. You can treat these. Um, first of all, you can spray that with water. It's, it sounds weird that you're going to treat powdery mildew with water, but again, a quick blast of water in the morning um, and do that over a few days and you can get rid of a lot of it. Now, if you're go choosing to use a substance, you want to make sure that it's a sulfur product or a copper fungicide and that it's used as a soap, not a dust. You, you might remember the old days where they had the big containers of dust and we'd just pour it all over and probably not wearing a mask. That is not advised anymore. It absorbs into your skin um, and into your respiratory system. But there's a lot of other um, products. Thanks, Tracy. Um, a lot of other products, we recommend the neem oils at, that you can um, apply to your roses. Now, one thing about the oils and soaps is they don't have long lasting effect. It's an immediate, takes care of it right now, but you've got to come back and apply it on a regular basis. Uh, I have a note in here, copper fungicides are organic. People worry they might need to spray their um, trees with some of these materials, like their fruit trees in the off season to prevent insects later on. Copper fung Today's copper fungicides are made of copper sulfate. Um, I collect rocks and minerals. I have a whole bunch of rocks, a whole bunch of minerals that are made of copper sulfate. It's a safe product to handle and to use. And it's blue because when you crush up copper rocks, they're blue. So it's not, it's all, it's natural. That's safe also to use in organic gardening. Okay, next please. I get to some, okay, some of these that are maybe people aren't quite as familiar. Okay, a few details on each of these products I've mentioned. They are less toxic that, than some of the sprays or applications you might see with the real fancy names at the nursery. Now, insecticidal soaps, they cause uh, cell, they're just really soap. Uh, you can make your own insecticidal soap with a dishwasher list, a tablespoon of dishwasher soap and a gallon of water, and it actually works as well as the store-bought kind. But an insecticidal soap, it either smothers the insect or it interferes with their cells. It actually breaks their cells, they leak, and then they dry up and they dehydrate. So it is, as far as humans in the environment goes, a safe way to take care of the insects. It only works immediately it doesn't stay on the plant and catch the guys later. So when you spray it, you get the you get the insects right now, but you have to come back later and spray often. But it doesn't hurt the plants. The soap is fine for your garden. There's nothing in it that damages anything. So we highly recommend if insecticidal soap is recommended for the pests you're after, that's a good choice. Now the oils, you hear a lot about the oils and there's kind of two different kinds. Some of the um, oils that are recommended are actually petroleum based and they're mineral oils. And they're, it's real mineral oil, like what's in big oil or the mineral oil that's in your bathroom cabinet. It's actually the same product. It's a byproduct from when they produce gasoline but it is considered an organic product. There's no man-made fooling around with the composition. So petroleum oils, even though that sounds weird and icky um, to put 
something related to gas or oil on your plants, the mineral oil is a very good product. Now, neem oil comes from a plant, it's a plant oil, uh, a tree that grows in India. And that's a good insecticide or pesticide. I should, well, it's an insecticide. That's a good pesticide. It basically, and there's other oils too, jojoba. Actually, canola oil is um, in some of the products that you might be cooking with. The oils smother the insect. That's all they do. They don't really do anything else though. They don't affect eggs. You know, there's no long term. It's again, it's immediate. I'm gonna smother you right now, die. And then you have to come back later and put more on. But it's a plant product. So all, this, all these things are biodegradable. Um, they go back to nature in your garden and they don't, there's no leftover uh, residue that you have to worry about. But go easy. You don't have to go crazy with the application. Now, the other microbial I have on here, microbials are actually living organisms. They call them micro, because like you need a microscope to see them. They're really, really tiny. Some of them are bacteria, some of them are viruses. So it's a natural way um, we're using nature to kill other parts of nature. However, one of the things we discovered, we had been recommending uh, this Bacillus thuringiensis, otherwise known as BT, because it is, um, it is um, targeted, it's a selective pesticide. One of the problems came up, we've had an emphasis on encouraging pollinator gardens in the last couple of years. And some of the master gardeners did some research and they realized that the BT also kills the caterpillars. Uh, this type is uh, geared towards caterpillars and then they have one for mosquitoes. The BT for caterpillars kills all the caterpillars. So, you know, those beautiful butterflies you hope that will visit your garden, well, they started as caterpillars. So if gardeners kill off all the caterpillars in the garden and not realizing that those are the future butterflies, that's a problem. So we're kind of going back and forth on the, the microbial, the BT one. You need to think about that and make a decision for your garden. I think a lot of us are kind of drawing back from that a little bit because we're trying to give a lot of our plants over to the caterpillars so that we can encourage pollinators. Um, the BT also has to, all of these things have to be repeated often. There's no residual effect that will stay in your garden. Okay, next. Okay, hey, now you may, if you've looked at the aisles, you may have noticed some other products and you weren't sure whether they were worth purchasing or not. Um, these, there are products that are not governed by the government, but that doesn't mean they're worthless or anything. You might see things made out of these food products, cinnamon, clove, garlic, mint. Uh, food products that you might've heard mentioned used in the garden before for pesticide use. Most of these are somewhat effective, <clears throat> kind of depends um, on, it depends on your garden and your situation. These type products are affected, <clears throat> pardon me, on soft bodied insects, the ones that are fairly easy to kill. And some of them actually act on the organism itself, some are just repellent. They make the environment not, um, Incur not safe or encouraging for the organism. But again, so it doesn't hurt. Um, there are some of this, uh, this, I'm not sure again how you see approved, but there are some of this that put cinnamon down for the ants in our house or um, apply some of these other products. So if you wanna try some, um, go for it and see. They might be effective, but they really won't hurt. They're all food products, they're all biodegradable. Um, Read the label carefully, but it won't hurt anything if you want to try some of these. Some people do have some success with them. Okay, next. Okay, quick, um, this slide and the next one kind of go together, but I can't toggle back and forth and we're not going to try to do that. I just want to explain one more time, soaps and oils, it's kind of confusing sometimes. What, uh, they're really mostly effective on soft, bodied insects. So some of the flying bugs that may be in the garden, they're not going to be affected by this, but their larvae might be. So 
um, soaps are usually used for leafy, herbaceous, or small plants. Um, the coverage is good there. Where oils stick a little bit better, so those are maybe used on uh, woody plants. And scale doesn't um, respond to soapy insecticides as well, so oil is better for scale on plants. Um, again, the oils are sometimes used as dormant treatments. It's the same, the horticultural oil are the same ones we spray on our fruit trees during the winter to pre uh, prevent leaf peach curl. So some of these are used for various reasons. Um, caution, <laughs> today's probably not the day to use them. <coughs> Pardon me, I'm sorry. Um, you can't use these in hot weather. Once the temperatures get into the 90s, uh, sometimes the oils can actually damage the plant you put it on, but they're not as effective, which the temperatures affect a lot of things going on in our garden. And what they do, again, is they either smother the living insect or they disrupt its internal um, processes. They, they damage the cells. But you have to be careful. Some of these will only go for the living adult or they only apply to the larva. And most of them aren't much good on the eggs. So you would maybe use the product today and then come back in a week or check every day to look and see and then come back in a week or two and reapply. So you do need to reapply as those eggs hatch. Okay, next slide. These are some of the organisms that these soaps and oils or for a lot of them a blast of water. Um, are effective. So soaps and oils, if you're, if the aphids in your garden have just gone crazy, you might try, try the water, uh, decrease their numbers a little bit, and then maybe make yourself or buy some uh, insecticidal soap spray and go out there and squirt them off in the morning. Immature scales are, scales a little bit harder to um, deal with because it's hard to see, um, but this is somewhat effective and you're smothering it. Immature, uh, the white flies, thrips, lace bugs, the psyllids, we're really lucky in Amador. We don't have too many psyllids yet. So this was, goes back to what Doris was saying, please buy local, please don't bring those from the valley. Uh, spider mites and then some of the other diseases, soaps and oils, whether it's a homemade, don't home make your oil, go buy that. But the soap, you, you could make up a batch for yourself. You know what, I, I see a comment, um, try real hard for the leaf curl, try really hard. I don't always get three sprays in, but you know, around Thanksgiving, you're doing a spray and then two more around um, Christmas or New Year's and then one more after that. You probably won't get rid of all of your leaf curl, but you can decrease it a lot. Um, and even if you can't get three sprays in, if you can even get one in, it, it might help. I had it kind of bad at the beginning of the season, but mine gone now, the leaves have replaced themselves. Okay, next please. And okay, we're hitting on our time. I'm gonna move a little bit faster here. Okay, this goes back to the microbials. Um, they are made from um, natural products because they're little living organisms. But um, we just want to caution you for their use with, um, if you're using them for caterpillars or to be aware of watching out for the caterpillars. And again, these are mostly systemic where it has to go through the plant and then the caterpillar, so you're going to probably pour it in the ground, have it come up through the plant. Then the caterpillars have to eat the plant. Um, because home gardeners were not allowed to use really, really super strong materials, luckily, um, it breaks down rapidly, which is good. We don't want it in the environment, but it has to be reapplied quickly. Okay, next. Oh, uh, one, uh, some of these are used for fungus gnats. And um, I found, I copied UC Davis Arboretum and I added sand to the top layer of my indoor pots when I grew plants this year for our plant sale that didn't happen. And I've done that two years in a row and the sand in the potting soil decreased the fungus gnats greatly, greatly. So you, you could uh, maybe monkey around with your soil before you start applying things to get rid of the, and keep it drier, uh, those fungus gnats. But that's a whole different class. Okay, uh, next please, Doris. 
this word one is mentioning, um, I want to go straight to, because we're running out of time, um, the middle one. Pyrethrin is a botanical pesticide, insecticide, because it's made from chrysanthemums, from chrysanthemum flowers. So things like that are safe to use in your garden. Uh, another one I want to mention, because we get a lot of questions, uh, the last one, what do you do about the ants? Okay, ants out in your garden, maybe you should do nothing about them. Maybe they're helping you. Uh, they can get carried away on some of your plants, but take a good look at the ants in your garden. We start um, putting out bait for them. They may be helping you as much as hurting you, but nobody wants ants in their house and some of their buildings. And the borate type ant um, control products actually are quite good. They're made with boric acid. Um, you can make a homemade version if you want. It's not that complicated, but the, and we don't recommend specific products, but Tara was the only one that had a good picture for me to put in here. And those are pretty safe. Again, you have to keep them away from your pets or your kids. My granddaughter was visiting. I had to run around and make sure I didn't have any old of those left any place. But the boric acid, the borate ant traps are quite safe to use and they don't have residual anything. The ants eat the material, take it back to their nest. In fact, the way to control them getting in your house is follow their path, figure out where they're getting into your house, seal any small holes you may have, but put the traps where they're entering your house. I know my daughter and I have quite a lot of trouble with ants out here in Comanche, and we've had good luck with those uh, boric acid or borate traps, and they're safe for the environment. Next, please. Okay, a couple of quick words on some resources. Master Gardeners provide the public with a lot of information about pests. And we have these group of publications called Pest Notes, and they come in all different forms. So the group that's online, um, when you figure out what you think you might have as a pest, you can go to the UC IPM website and get lots of information, more information about the pest, what the damages they do, and then how to control them. So this is a really valuable website to help you make your decisions because they include the basic information, but then also suggestions about the applications. Doris, next please. If you click at the bottom of the previous page in real life, you'll get pesticide information and will come up on the recommended products that, that we're recommending you might try for that pest. And they tell you what the other repercussions might be so that you can decide whether you want to use it. Is it safe to have around pets? One thing that comes up a lot is it's safe around honeybees. And so the particular horticultural oil, which we've been talking a whole lot about, is not that great for honeybees, it turns out. And you can find that out from looking at the different bits of information here. Now, what we didn't realize perhaps is that you have to use the horticultural oil at certain times of the day if bees are a problem. Because the yellow color, you can't see the scale, I apologize, I didn't copy that right. The scale on honeybees is yellow, which indicates there's a caution there. And then when you look further in the information, it it advises uh, the time of the day when you should use the product to keep it safer for honeybees and other um, animals or organisms also, including us. Okay, next, please. Okay, probably the most important advice we could give you this whole day is to read the darn label because it has so much information for you, maybe not directly on the bottle, and I'll get to that, but. When people create all of these products, they have all these ideas in mind of all the things they're gonna do and that the products are gonna do, but there's all this information that has to go with it, like any other possibly dangerous product. But on the label, the, the information that you need to make your decisions is you need to make sure you have the right product and what the active ingredients are. Um, directions for use, which can vary. And then there's also always precautionary statements that I'll get to. Hate to bring it up, but first aid, you need to know right away what the level is for danger on these. Notes to physicians, storage and disposal. Now, 
funny. I don't see all that on the label example I gave you. Because if you look at what I circled, most of these products come from with what we call the little booklet is taped or glued to the bottle of the product will be a little multi-page booklet that hopefully has all this information in it. Now that's a really great idea that we can have that little booklet to keep, but I wear glasses for a darn good reason. And it's not that easy to read those little books and the information's very important. So what, in at least in California, the law is those little books also have a website on them. And the smart thing to do is to go to the website that you can actually read and get this information for yourself because that will help you decide whether it's, um, you want to use that product or not. Um, and one of the big things we're looking for, I think, next, next slide, please, is on the product, the first thing you want to check out is you look for the, what they call the signal word. All products in the United States that have a license from um, the government, they have the signal word pretty large. Now, lucky for us, the example I used is, I used this label because a lot of the labels are here in California are in English and Spanish, so that a lot of people are covered with important information. But there will always be, on the chart I have on the left, the signal words that they use are caution, warning, danger, or danger poison. Now, luckily for us, most of the products that home gardeners are allowed to use are the caution level, the lowest. Now, they're not totally, you know, harmless, but the government and researchers have decided that they're safe enough for us to use on a regular basis. So you really want to double check that. Maybe not so much with the newer products, because most of what you reach for on the shelf is going to be only at the caution level, but older products that many people complain that they can't get anymore are still in people's garages and they have the more um, serious levels. So the signal word is uh, uh, very important for you to check real quick before you decide to use the product. Okay, next, I think we'll wind this up. Oh, directions, we'll go through that. Uh, Doris, let's just skip this one. It has, check out the, that little book on the website for specific directions. No, keep going. I want to do the safety, the clothing. Thank you. Okay, another big, big idea here. I picked out these three pictures um, to show you good and maybe not so good. Think about it. When the researchers and the scientists create these products, in their minds, they and when they run the tests, they are imagining that we're dressed like these two guys that we have maybe a hat on, but that we have a mask on our face, that we have gloves on, long pants, sturdy shoes, um, and carefully applying the application. They don't think we look like the lady in the bottom picture or my next door neighbor. He favors shorts, at least she has long pants on. No mask, no gloves, she's got flip flops on. Now, don't feel bad, but how many of us, well, I can honestly say that I haven't because I'm always preaching about this, but how many people have applied those applications with flip-flops or sandals, shorts and a t-shirt, no gloves, no mask, maybe you had a hat on because it was sunny. That is not what the safety regulations have been written for. When it says caution, they think you're dressed like this. So please think about that. Um, there's a lot of questions right now about the effect of some of the chemicals we're using and if you cover up you'll be a lot safer next please doris okay these are the ways that these uh, materials get into us when we are not covered up and um, the toxicity you know it depends on the product um, we usually use low toxic materials so we don't sometimes people add too much that's not the answer we could be absorbing when we're out there with our shorts and t-shirt. We could be absorbing it through our skin. It just depends on the product. Uh, chances are you're not drinking it. However, if you had it on your hands, your bare hands, and touched your mouth or picked up your coffee or your soda, it's getting closer. 
Okay, the breathing or respiratory, we're all aware of weird things in the garden that make us cough and sneeze. Well, we don't want it to be the harmful materials. And then your eyes, your eye coverage is very, very important. None of these materials are meant to be sprayed in people's eyes. Um, and I think, okay, next. If I sound preachy, it's because I am on this subject. Okay, I want to finish with, um, take a look at the UCIPM website. There are a variety of pages that are very, very helpful. And one of them is you can get monthly information about maybe some pest problems that might occur in your garden each month and what to do about them. If you go to the website and you look at home, garden, turf, and landscape pests, and you'll see the page when you get there. On, um, thank you. There is a seasonal landscape IPM checklist each month for all the different counties. Like we have a lady here from Stanislaus. You can get your own. You don't have to look at the amateur one. And they have high and low elevation. Most of Amador where things grow is actually within, I think the low elevation is 2,000 feet and below. But um, you can get targeted information. Next, please, Doris, I have it on there. Okay, you'll get a page like this that you can click on. There's also a printer friendly one you can print out. But you can click on this. Sometimes they're one page, sometimes they're two. Depends on the time of the year and how many pests are out there. But there's great information on each of these uh, clickable items as to what you do about that problem right now. So it's a short shortcut to something that's very valuable. And I think that's it for me. I think we have resources up next. And I think that's the end. Okay, and uh, thank you very much for joining us. I'm going to turn this back over to Doris or to Ed, I guess to Ed. Yep. Thank you, Maureen. So. Sure. We've had some questions and um, we've um, tried to answer them in the chat, but since not everybody's monitoring the, the chat, we, I thought it would be good if we read through some of the questions. Um, and I'll point out that the answers that we've posted in the chat, you'll notice some, quite a number of them, the answer came from a, an IPM website. So the IPM website that, um, Maureen was showing you is really a good go-to place on a lot of these questions. So let me start at the top here. Cheryl asked, how do we get rid of the invasion of border bugs? And I found an article by Scott Onetto about the bordered plant bug, which basically said, you know, they're kind of annoying, but don't spray them with anything. Uh, I had some of those eating my tomatoes and I just sacrificed one tomato and they concentrated on one and just made that one tomato ugly, but they left the rest of them all alone. So, and they're quick. I think Dora said she was picking off bugs, but those guys are quick. I don't know if um, Tracy or, or Doris or Maureen want to add anything. No, I read Scott's article and it's, it's uh, patience, wait them out, pick them yeah. out and wait them out. Yeah, I, I agree. They'll ultimately go away. It's they're just ugly. <laughs> so we have uh, two questions that are sort of related. They're different. Um, one is uh, Dawn dish soap is good or better than ivory, and the other about neem oil uh, used against aphids. Um, Tracy mentioned spraying with water is the first effective way to remove the aphids and um, doing it daily until they're gone. And I think Maureen mentioned the same in her discussion. Ed, the soap solution, the soap solution is amended to be 2%, but that's like, no, I'm, even I'm not gonna take time to try to figure that out. So the typical recipe is a tablespoon for a gallon of water. Uh, and, right. and I have found Dawn, Dawn is, uh, has a slightly different makeup and ivory, and um, it does seem to be more effective. And then don't do like my grandfather. My grandfather was, if um, one teaspoon is good, oh, let's give it a cup. Yeah, don't do that. It'll backfire on you with this. Yeah. yeah. I posted a recipe in the chat as well. Thanks. So that you can... So you'll have that. 
great, thank you. Uh, how do we get rid, rid of bindweed without pesticide? I use copper sulfate for black spot on roses. Is it organic? Well, I guess that was two for there, two questions. Tracy posted an article about bindweed. Uh, hoeing and hand pulling can be effective. I didn't read the article, Tracy. Is there anything you want to add on that? Um, I would just say, you know, it depends on the size of your property, but if you've got it in the home, you know, around your home landscape, hand pulling, hoeing is really effective. It's an easy plant to pull up. Um, and then there's some more details on if, you know, say you had it in your pasture to get rid of it. It's about timing if you're going to spray. So that pet net will be effective. And Julia <laughs> reminds us about... Um, rodents, um, pesticides for killing rodents, is that you might also kill other things like owls, hawks, foxes, bobcats, your own cat, your puppies. Yeah. 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 Oh, quick, you know what I forgot? And that you even sent me that note about it. Keep your bottles and labels. Should you have a tragedy where your pet got into some of these, you need to take the container with you to the vet. They need to see the specific container. And I forgot, I, we even had double notes on that one. Uh, should you have some, and of course, if your child, but yeah. um, if your pet gets sick, or you're not even sure, take the container with you to the vet, please. Yeah, that's good. Uh, no point in guessing. No. Uh, okay, so Cheryl asks, what's the best way to keep earwigs off of your roses? And uh, Tracy posted a um, IPM uh, notes about controlling the earwigs. And there's a there another one you can wait out. You can wait out your earwigs. It'll get hot enough that they can't they can't deal with it. Okay. If you you can also have some patience with your earwigs. Yeah, I, you know, my garden has chew marks on everything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Alternative with, alternatively, with the earwigs, you can put down a board in the evening and the next morning turn the board over and brush them off into the trash. Yep. Okay. And that'll help reduce the, the earwigs. Mm -hmm. The next one, um, Maureen addressed during the discussion uh, how to deal with peach, peach leaf curl and still have an issue. And then Tracy well, you know, posted an IPM are link. They spraying, are they spraying with two things? They need to be spraying with a copper fungicide. They also need to be using the oil. I think you have to double up for the peach leaf curl. You want to use the copper fungicide and uh, the neem oil or the horticultural oil. At least that's according to Dennis and the Home Orchard book. So make sure you're doing both you okay. can mix them together in the same bottle you can mix them together in the same bottle and then just do one applic well you one do try for three but yeah yeah okay. but there's two things involved there okay and then gail asks what can be used on black small black slugs that invade my strawberries Ooh, those little guys oh interesting Huh. Well, you know, the, I don't have those. And I don't I either. Throw my garden yeah, we my strawberries we in. might have to look that oh. one up. I'd want to know what the slugs are first to make sure what they are. So. I'll post, but, the, I'll post the IPM pest note for slugs and snails, but um, a couple of things that work is you can take like an old tuna can, clean it out, and just put a little bit of beer in the bottom, and that'll draw the uh -huh. slugs over there and then you go and check it in the morning and discard them. Um, the spinosad product like Sluggo would take care of them. Just be real careful with that because it does um, kill other caterpillars and um, larva as well. Um, and then just getting up early in the morning, Gail, and picking them off for strawberry <laughs> plants. Okay, we had a question about praying mantis eggs. Um, should I relocate the praying mantis eggs 
um, let's see. so can I relocate the praying mantis to a tree away from the garden and let them migrate all over? Uh, and then the answer somebody posted in chat, uh, you can put the eggs in your garden bin, two or 300 will emerge and then move them further away. Because right. they eat each other. They Don't forget them. that part. Are they going to eat each other? Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. They are voracious hunters. And as soon as they emerge from that egg sac, they will, um, they will eat each other. Um, we also, as master gardeners, don't recommend that you order uh, the insects and bring them into your home landscape. Let the beneficials come naturally. I see them on my fence and on my wall. I don't see them in my garden. Maybe they're hiding. They've also been known to hang around uh, hummingbird feeders. They will eat oh. a small hummingbird. Gosh. Wow. Yeah. So um, Lucy asks, what do you think about rabbit and deer repellent spray? And I answered, I live in Pioneer and I have a fence and I use a lot of that stuff. It works, but it doesn't work really well. And it certainly doesn't last for the one to two weeks that the label says. Um, in order to keep the deer off my red yucca, I have to spray it every day. Um, the best solution that I've come up with is either plant things that, that they don't like or fence and plan to share, even though you don't want to. Plan to share with them? With the yeah. Yeah. yeah, they're going to get part of it no matter what. I've used uh, the repeller, the water repellers on something that I really want to protect. Yeah. Okay. Let's you see. don't want a fence. I I think that's everything in chat. Um, is, uh, is there any more questions? Uh, not hearing any more. All right, well, so if there's no more questions, uh, let's see, we have a class coming up. Um, help me out, Doris. I'm blanking on where this class is coming up. Uh, our next class is in August, but there's another class um, that's going to be online on the 7th, I believe it is, um, on Lavender from the uh, El Dorado County. July 8th at 9 a.m., El Dorado County will be presenting all about Lavender. Okay, great. And then on August 15th, um, probably at 9 a.m. we'll be doing cool weather crops and cold frames. Okay. All right. So thank you everybody for uh, coming today and thank you to our presenters, um, Doris and Maureen. And uh, I hope that uh, everybody has learned something they can apply in their garden. So we'll see you next time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Great job, Doris. Great job, Maureen.